So chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 15. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You guys can be seated. All right, so today we are going to talk about generosity. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like it uh, kind of piggybacks on a little bit of what Chuck talked about last week. Um, and God actually... I felt like he downloaded this into my spirit like Wednesday or Thursday before Chuck preached. So it's kind of cool that I feel like it kind of goes with it. But um, what I wanted to talk about today was just generosity. And as, as Christians, what is generosity? What does that look like? Um, this is going to be a bit of a teaching. I want to give some practical examples for you guys and um, just kind of go through the word and go through like the who, what, when, where, how, and why of generosity. So if you guys can all be in agreement with me on that, I'll go ahead and jump on in. Um, so let's start with the who. Uh, who. Who must be generous? If we look at 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, we see an answer to this question. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the answer to the question of who must give is everyone. He says, each and every one. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, woman, man, old, young. Like all of us, if we are Christians, we should have a spirit of generosity. Stingy and Christian don't go together. They're mutually exclusive. You can't be a stingy Christian, or at least you shouldn't be a stingy Christian. Um, so everybody that's going to say, hey, I have... I have a relationship with Jesus, his spirit lives within me, is somebody that should be generous. So who should we be generous towards? Well, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Let's start there. 1 Timothy 5, 8. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So there are a lot of areas that as Christians we can and should be generous towards. But one that's really highlighted strongly in Paul's letter to Timothy is, uh, and this is instructions for the church. So he's, Paul is, you know, the apostle that is informing Timothy, who is more like the local pastor of the church. And he's telling Timothy, make sure everybody understands this. Make sure when you read this letter, everybody understands that, like, we got to take care of our family. And I don't want to say that necessarily family comes first. I'm not going to put these in a priority. However, when you look at one of the roles of the church, it's to take care of people. It's to take care of people that are in need inside the congregation. But think about how many less people would be in need if we as Christians just took care of our family first. If we, if we made sure that our family was taken care of, then that puts a lot of the, uh, I don't want to say the stress of it, but like that, that takes some of the responsibility off of the church having to provide if we are providing for our own family. So what I would encourage you guys to do is today, like as, as I'm going through this message and, and as you go on this week, like start thinking about that. Like who are family members, who are relatives that I have that I can be generous towards? Sometimes your generosity to a lost family member might be what wins them to Jesus Christ. When, you, when, they, when they know that you don't agree with anything in their life, the way that they're living, and I've got family members like that, my wife has family, like, there's people in our lives, in our family, that aren't believers, and they live a very different lifestyle. They live a lifestyle very um, aligned with the world and not very aligned with the word, and we still be generous to them. 
you know, they've been in situations, they've been in tough spots. Um, and again, this doesn't just, this isn't just talking about like parents and kids. This is also like kids looking after your parents. Um, it's talking about a brother looking after a sister, um, you know, an aunt or an uncle looking after a niece or a nephew. Um, so this is especially the members of your household, but even outside of that, like taking care of your relatives is a big area we want to be generous towards. The second one that we'll look at is in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. All right. It says, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. It's another group of people that I think sometimes, and I'm not saying this in our church necessarily, but I just think sometimes in churches that gets overlooked is the pastor. The man who stands up here and preaches the word of God to you, like that is what he makes his living off of. Now, there are some pastors that are bivocational and they work and they preach, and I don't know how they do it because it took me forever to prepare this and I'm only going to talk for like 20 minutes, so I don't know how they do all of it. But, um, but like the, the word tells us, like the people that are proclaiming the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And so something that we can't forget when, when we're being generous is like, we can't forget to take care of our pastor. We can't forget to take care of Aaron, you know, the, the man who proclaims the gospel and teaches us and instructs us and disciples us in the word. Um, and it's easy when you start, as I, as I kind of go through this and you start seeing other areas of need, um, it's easy to maybe overlook that one. So I just wanted to make sure that I put that one in here. Um, the next one, we'll go back to 2 Corinthians. We'll go back to our main passage here in 2 Corinthians 9. And it is verse 12 says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So another area of who we should be generous towards is the saints and the work of ministry. It's the people inside this building. It's our brothers and sisters in Fort Wayne. I mean, it's, it's Christian believers. Um, we have to make sure that our money is going to our family you know, our church family. So like if there's needs in this room, we should be generous to that. We should make sure that we're helping to meet those needs inside this room and not just relying on a tithe in church and church leadership to meet those needs, but we as a congregation, if I know that somebody needs something, I should go help them. If you know that somebody needs something, you should go help them. And I've actually seen that a couple of times in this church really, really well, and I love it. So um, I think we're doing really good in that area. Um, but it's just something, again, that I want to remind us that that is, that is very important. And when I say also in ministry, I mean the advancement of the gospel, taking the gospel elsewhere as well. Um, because the church isn't just here to be a social club, and it's not just here for us all to love each other and sing kumbaya. This is more like... <laughs> This is more like, this is more meant to be like boot camp. Like this is training up the army of God to go out into the world. You know what I mean? And so when we train up and equip here and equip the saints for the work of ministry, what we're doing is we're giving the tools and the resources necessary for the people inside this room to take the gospel to the people outside this room. And then the last one, and there are a ton of references here, and I didn't want to bounce all over the place, so we're just gonna we're gonna stay in the passage that we're in. But is verse nine? It says, "As it is written, he is distributed freely; he is given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever." God makes it a point all through Scripture. I don't think you can read probably any of the Gospels and not see that Jesus wants us to take care of the poor. I mean, he said, like, the amount of commands that Jesus says in the gospel of sell your belongings, give to the poor, sell your belongings, give to the poor. Um, the fourth area that I wanted to touch on is that we need to take care of the poor. And I wanted to give a little bit of perspective here um, because I was exposed in person to extreme poverty when I went to Argentina. I had never seen poverty to that level before. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't, there isn't poverty in America. There is, for sure, 100%. Like, 
hopefully nobody in here is living in that level of poverty because we should be helping you, as I said. But if you are, like, reach out. Um, but when I went to Argentina, what I saw, like, changed me. Like, I, I thought I knew what poor looked like. You know, I lived out of my car one summer for because I made some dumb decisions. And so I thought, like, I thought I knew what poor looked like. Um, but when I went there and realized that, like, there's people that don't actually have access to running water. <laughs> like, like, um, like, I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to eat tonight. And there was people there that didn't have food. Um, one of the ways that we gave through Hope Tree International, um, one of the ways that we gave is we provided them with the resources to make food for people. So what they would do is they would take these giant burners and these giant kettles and these giant propane tanks and they would show up in these villages and they would like cook stew. And it was amazing how many people would come because they're just hungry. And so we would feed them in a very like physical way, but then we would also start feeding them with the word of God. But I mean, that was like, and they would just show up with anything that they had that could hold food. They didn't show up with awesome bowls or you know, Tupperware container. I mean, it was literally just like a sand bucket that has chips and cracks in it and probably isn't even holding the food that well. And they're like tucking a shirt under it, trying to make sure it doesn't leak out. I mean, it was like there was some extreme poverty there. And so when we say take care of the poor, yes, I mean here, the poor. But I also mean like the poor poor, like the extreme levels of poverty all throughout the world. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a passage and it's, um, it's the rich guy and Lazarus. And like the rich guy is living this wealthy life. And there's this man named Lazarus that's sitting outside of his gate. This beggar that's sitting out of sight of his gate. And the Bible describes it that dogs were licking his wounds. Like he was such a lame beggar that he just laid there and like dogs licked his wounds. Like he had open sores from just laying there. Um, and at the end of that parable, or, or throughout that parable, one of the things that you find is that the rich man went to more or less went to hell, and Lazarus went to heaven. And one of the things that was talked about was like, this guy was at your gate, and you never helped him. He, like, he lived a terrible life on earth, and now he's in Abraham's bosom, and you lived an amazing life on earth and didn't pay any attention to the poor guy sitting at your gate. So I just want to make sure that we don't ever forget that. Like, we're the rich people in the story in America, and there's lots and lots of poor people that are right outside our gates, right across our borders that need that need our generosity. So moving on, so that was the who of generosity. Moving on to the what. What must we be generous with? Um, we're gonna go ahead and bounce back to 1 Timothy here. We're gonna go to 1 Timothy 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So when we read this, we see a couple of things that we should be generous with. Um, in verse 18 it says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. So one of the areas is our time. We need to do good and be rich in good works. Um, generosity isn't just a money thing. For some of us, people like me, uh, some people might, might be like me, but like I'm, I can be pretty loose with my money. Like you need, you need 100 bucks, I can give you 100 bucks. That's not a big thing, but man, you want two hours of my time? Like that's precious. <laughs> like, like that's... Like, that's two hours that I'm not getting to swim in the pool with my kids, or I'm not getting to build Legos with Ember, or I'm not just getting to spend some quality time with my wife, you know? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna praise her for this and give her a little bit of um, public praise, but like, you worked on uh, a video for the Misfits to help them raise money and promote um, the ministry um, for homeless people that she serves on Sunday nights. And like, it's, I'm getting emotional about this because man, sorry. It's not easy to give up time with you. To have you do those things. 
And I watched a lot of hours go into that. <laughs> and I miss you on a lot of Sunday nights. But it, you're doing what this says, and I love it, and it's awesome. And it makes me a better person to see it. So one area that we got to be prepared to be generous in is our time. Um, the other area that it talks about here that we need to be generous in is we need to be ready to share. Same in verse 18, it says, be generous and ready to share. We got to be generous with our money. Um, the Lord says that you can't serve God and money. That's back in Matthew somewhere. <laughs> I don't remember exactly where, but it's in Matthew. He says you can't serve God and money. You can only have one master. And if your treasure is money, that's where your heart's going to be. And your life is going to revolve around that. It's something I taught my kids a long time ago. I said, you are going to sell out to something in your life. You will sell out to something. It might be fame. It might be success. It might be family. It might not even be like bad worldly things. It might just be your family. But I was like, you're going to sell out to something. And I remember telling Brittany this. I said, sell out to God. I said, make that your treasure. Make that your heart. Because the world will tell you to sell out to money. Or it'll tell you to sell out to stuff. Or it'll tell you to sell out to even like your family. Oh, the kids are the most important thing in the world. Well, they're not. They're not. I mean, I love them, but they're not the most important thing in the world. The most important thing in the world is God. And so we got to be ready to break ties with our money. And that's a hard thing to do. Like, you show me where you put your time. You show me where you put your money. And I, I know the kind of person you are. Like, those are the two things. If you're putting your time into, you know, sports, and that's where you're devoting all of your time and all of your money is going into like going and watching your favorite sports team and all this other stuff. Like I know where your heart lies. Like you love sports. I'm not saying you worship it more than God, but like you can see just from time and money where somebody's heart's at. So make sure that your heart is aligned with God and that your money is going where God wants it to go. Look at your checkbook and say, where, where'd my money go last month? Look at every cent. That, uh, I mean, nobody uses a checkbook anymore. Look at your bank statement. <laughs> Pull out your Three Rivers app and look at last month and say, where did every single one of my pennies go? Where did every dollar bill that I spent go last month? And when I look at that, is that showing me that my heart is inclined towards God and his will and what he wants us to do? Or is that showing me that maybe my priorities are a little bit off? Are there some areas where maybe I spent money that could have spent it a little bit differently. Maybe I should have spent it a little bit differently. So do that, that's uh, legitimately, like legitimately, I want you guys to do that. Again, this is a practical sermon. I wanted you guys to be able to take some stuff back to this week and do this. So take the time, look at that. Another area, the third one, and the last one that we'll talk about is your gifts, talents, skills, and abilities. Um, God equips each and every one of us with something a little bit different. So I know I lumped a bunch of things in there. I said gifts, talents, skills, and abilities. It's all lumped into one. But the gist of it is like the, the thing that's unique about you that maybe somebody else can't do. For example, I can't fix a car. So if I need my car fixed, like one of you guys needs to help me because I can't do it. One of you, I'm going to ask one of you to be generous. Hey, can you be generous and help me fix my car? Um, but, you know, it's the other way too. Like I have, I have certain gifts and talents and abilities that you don't have. And so we work together as a body and find those things. And when we're all being generous, then all the needs should be met. When we're all being generous with all of the different abilities and skills that we have, we should all be having our needs met. All right, the when. I'm talking way slower and saying way more than I should. Okay, when. When must we give? Uh, turn with me. Well, actually, let's start, let's start with, we'll stay right where we're at, 618 again. Um, 1 Timothy 6.18 says, They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, and be ready to share. So there is an immediacy to our giving, an urgency to our giving. There's kind of two things that I was looking at in this. It's that you've got the planned and the prepared giving, but you have like the urgent now giving. So there are going to be times where you should plan and prepare your giving. But you should also allow freedom and flexibility for the Holy Spirit to put things on your heart and say, I want you to give to this right now. In this moment, you see this need. There are times where Jesus had a mission, and he's going. I, I can't remember exactly which story it was, but I think it's when he's, he's going to uh, raise somebody's daughter. But on the way there to raise this daughter from the dead, um, this lady touches him, and it's the lady, lady with the flow. And he pauses, and he stops, and he, he, had, he deals with that situation right there in the moment. He had a plan. He knew where he was going. He was prepared. 
but then he was willing to deviate and be generous and provide healing in this situation. So there's definitely an urgency and an immediacy to it. And then if we turn to 2 Corinthians 9, 7, we can kind of see the other version here. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The other one is planned and prepared giving. Also, um, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, which I don't think is one I gave you guys. That's okay. It says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. So Paul is writing a letter in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church, same as he is in, the second, in 2 Corinthians, but he tells them on the first day of the week, set something aside and store it up as you prosper. So he's not saying store up more than you should. I mean, he's not saying to do something that's not wise. He's saying, like, as God is prospering you, put that money aside, set aside an amount, think about it, pray on it. And again, that's the thing that I would encourage you guys to do is, like, look at your budget and say, like, how much realistically can I give planned and prepared? And how much maybe can I set aside to give just randomly when God puts it on my heart to give? Um, and, like, actually think that through. Think about how you can actually be generous with the money that you have planned and set aside, but also with the money that you can just meet a need when you see it. Maybe you see somebody or you got a coworker that's like, man, I'm struggling to pay rent this month. And you're like, hey, I've got 200 extra dollars because I set it aside. Like I planned and prepared for this. So now I can do it in the moment and help take care of that need. Next one is where must we be generous? So where we want to start, and this is my opinion, I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, but I think when we look at like Acts 1, verses, verse 8, we see how Jesus kind of started the apostles off on bringing the gospel out, and I think it's a good principle that we can follow for when we are being generous with our money. He says, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he started with the local. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem first, then you're going to be my witnesses in Judea and then Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So I think that that's kind of a model for how we should look at our generosity. When we are looking to be generous, like I said, there's some extreme poverty in other countries. But there's also people that are struggling here. There's needs that can be met right here. And so, like, let's start here and get the needs met here in Columbia City. And I'm not saying we forget about those people too, but I'm saying, like, let's, let's make sure we're taking care of the local and not just looking at the big picture, the, the global or the national level. Like, let's look at right here in Columbia City because guess what? If we can meet everybody's needs here in Columbia City and we can start equipping people, now when we move to Northeast Indiana, we've got way more people that are in a way better spot to be able to meet a way more needs. And then we can start looking at how do we do this for all of Indiana? How do we do this for the United States? And so on and so forth. So if you take care of, it's an old saying, if you sweep in front of your house, if everybody sweeps in front of their own house, then the street's completely clean. You know what I mean? So we can take care of, of a lot of people if we all just start with right here, right now. All right, how must we be generous? We're almost done. We're almost at the Y. How must we be generous? 2 Corinthians 8 is where we're going to turn for this one. So this is uh, Paul encouraging the Corinthians to give generously by sharing uh, a story of what the Macedonians did. And so sometimes, and I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but like I do this with my kids all the time. I'm letting out a little parenting secret. Don't listen too good. But like uh, you praise one kid for something and then the other kids kind of want to do it because you gave a bunch of praise to the one kid for doing it. You know what I mean? It's like one kid does the dishes and you're like, great job. I'm so glad you did the dishes. And the next time the dishes are dirty, another kid's like, I'll do the dishes. Like you gave a ton of praise. Like you, you really celebrated that. So I kind of think that that's what Paul's doing here a little bit. He's saying, I'm going to tell you what the Macedonians did to maybe kind of help motivate you guys to do the same. So when we look at... 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, he says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. 
For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Oh, I should have said verse 5 too, sorry. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Sorry, I should have had verse 5 in there. Um, so what we see here is how should we give? If you look at the Macedonians, it says that they were extremely poor. They were in extreme affliction. So they're being persecuted and beat down by somebody. I'm not exactly sure. I didn't do that much research. But they're being persecuted, beat down in severe affliction. And they've got extreme poverty and they have an abundance of joy. And that abundance of joy overflowed in a wealth of generosity. So we should be giving joyously, is one way I should say it. It also says that they gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So they were eager, they were begging, can we please give? We want to give. We're begging you, please come take our money so that you can give it to these saints, which I think is awesome. Like, imagine if that was the spirit of generosity that we had, you know, as a, as a Christian church. If we were like, we want to give our money. How much money can you take? What if they had to be like, I don't know if we can take that much money. Like, well, we just want to give it. We just, we're so eager to want to help and want to take care of these brothers and sisters. So I think we should give it joyfully. We should give it eagerly. It also says, they gave beyond their means. This is a tough one, but I think we need to give sacrificially. I think there's common practice there that there's the, there's the regular, you know, 10% tithe giving that a lot of people do, but also we got to give sacrificially. We got to give till it hurts. At least it hurts a little bit. I mean, we can look at passages in Scripture where and I, and I had these, but I didn't want to put them in because I didn't want to go too long last time I preached forever. So, um, But there, there's passages where Jesus tells people, like, sell everything and come follow me. There's the rich young ruler. He says, sell everything. Like, that's some serious sacrificial giving. I'm not saying that he's calling you or you or you or you. Like, I'm not saying he's calling you to sell everything. However, that could be what he's telling you to do. Absolutely could be. And... Are you, if you hear that from God, and you know that that's what God's saying, are you going to do that eagerly and joyously? I'll give you an example of uh, the rich young ruler versus Zacchaeus. So the rich young ruler that's talked about in the Gospels comes to Jesus and tells him, like, I'm following all the commandments, I'm doing all these good things. And Jesus says, well, the one thing that you still need is that you need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And Jesus knew, and I, and I touched on this earlier, like, where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be also. He knew, like, hey, your, your heart, it's stuck on stuff. It's stuck on material things. It's stuck on your wealth, your richness. Um, but then there's Zacchaeus, and I think you preached on this not that long ago, preached on Zacchaeus, where Jesus is like, hey, come on down. Like, I'm going to spend the day with you. And, you know, Zacchaeus ends up deciding to follow Jesus, and he sells half his stuff, gives it all away. Jesus didn't even tell him to do it. He just is like, he, and he, again, eager, joyous. He comes to God and he goes, God, I gave away half my stuff today, sold half my stuff and gave it to the poor. And he's just like, and if I defrauded anybody, I gave him four times as much as I defrauded him. Like the joy and the, and the eager, eagerness there. And there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about that kind of stuff. So we have to give joyously, we have to give eagerly, and we have to give sacrificially. So again, some homework for you. Um, I want you guys to pray into that. Ask God, like, where can I sacrifice a little bit even, just a little bit? Like, I'm just asking you to just start with something small. Maybe it's one or two Starbucks a week. <laughs> Say, I'm not going to I'm not gonna eat or I'm not going to drink two Starbucks a week. That's, what, 10 bucks, 12? I don't even know with inflation the way it is. It's probably like $14 for a Starbucks now. But <laughs> let's, <laughs> I don't even know. But let's say that's, you know, that's 10 or 15 bucks a week because you gave up a couple of Starbucks coffees. I'm not even saying you have to give up coffee. Like, I couldn't give up coffee. So, like, if, like you can still have your coffee in the morning. Maybe it's just not Starbucks coffee. Um, and so that's $10 or $15 a week. For four months, that's $60. Guess what? You can sponsor a kid through Compassion International so that they have food, they have shelter, they get to hear the word of God, and they get clothing for that kind of money. You might even be able to sponsor two kids. I don't know. But 
Like, that's something that me and my wife do, though. Like, it's, it, even little bits, like, make some sacrifices. I'm not telling you that you have to live, that, that you have to actively put yourself into a position of poverty. I'm not saying to do that, so don't, don't misunderstand. But I'm saying start looking where you can be sacrificial and then pray and see God in that. Because a little bit to you can go a long way for somebody else. And last but not least is the why. Why do we do this? Why must we be generous? So, I don't even actually need to turn there. It's a super common passage, and you all know it. But if we go to John 3.16, the reason why we are generous is because God was generous first. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God gave for us so that we can give for others. God purchased us for good works. He brought us into the family, not only because he loves us. Yes, he loves us. It says that right here. God loved us so much. But not only did he do it so that because he loved us, but he did it also to set an example for us of how we should live. And Jesus tells people that. He tells his disciples that. He says, this commandment I give you, like, live the way that I lived. Like, love people. And love has never seen anything other than this. Like, sacrifice your life for another person. That's the greatest sign of love. So sacrificially give, sacrificially be generous, not just with your money, but with your time, with your gifts, your talents, your resources, your abilities, because Jesus did it for us.